Social media has taken the world by storm. Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, Twitter, Tumblr, Snapchat, YouTube, Messenger, LinkedIn, and many others are now household names. But have you ever heard of the very first social media site, Six Degrees? It was created in 1997, but closed in 2001. Users of Six Degrees were able to upload a profile and make friends with other users. When others saw the potential of this new form of media, competition was frantic and soon other companies emerged. On the 1st of August 2003, MySpace was launched and quickly became the largest social media site in the world at that time. But the giant in social media began in February 2004. Facebook dominates the social media market with over one and a half billion people using it to connect with friends. If you want to succeed in social media, it is said that Instagram is the account you must have. With one billion active users every month and 500 million of them using Instagram every day, it's a very powerful medium of communication. So for many people today, the use of social media has become a necessary daily activity to connect with friends, share, create and spread information. Most users spend approximately one to two hours each day and they cannot imagine life without it. So the question is, how did we survive before all these forms of social media arrived? How much time are we spending on social media? And what is its impact in our lives? I'm Gary Kent. Join me as we navigate through this amazing digital world. I'm sure you've noticed how attached people are becoming to their mobile phones. As soon as it beeps or tells us we have a new message or email, we just can't resist checking it out. For many individuals, the majority of most communication, both personally and professionally, is now by mobile phone or email. Unfortunately, there seems to be a downside to this form of communication as it's sometimes easy to miscommunicate our message. Without the signals you can get from face-to-face -face interactions through body language, emotions and exhibited feelings, the words can sometimes send an unintended meaning. Words are singularly the most powerful force available to humanity. We can choose to use this force constructively with words of encouragement or destructively using words of criticism. Words have power and have the ability to help, to heal, to hinder, to hurt or to harm. Teachers at a local high school reportedly were concerned about the lack of conversational skills among some of their students. So they got together and decided to try an experiment. On a given evening, the participating teenagers were asked to shut down all their devices. The teachers then placed them separately in a real-time, face-to-face situation with individuals they didn't know. At first, the students had a very difficult time initiating or sustaining a conversation. They hadn't learned the art of small talk which is key in many professional careers and in personal and social interactions. Later, during the debriefing, the teenagers were heard to make comments such as, I don't have any trouble texting and tweeting, but I couldn't think of a thing to say in person. Or, wow, that was a lot harder than I expected. Or, I'm going to turn off my electronics for at least an hour a day and practice doing some real-time small talk. So what impact is all this screen time having on society? 
Well, we're going to find out. Our guest today, Dr. Arlene Taylor, is going to draw back the curtain and help us understand the impact screen time has on the human brain. Dr. Arlene Taylor is the founder and president of Realizations Inc., a nonprofit corporation that engages in brain function research. She's the author of several popular books related to brain function and practical applications to relationships and everyday living, and creator of the Longevity Lifestyle Matters program. Dr. Taylor, welcome to our program today. Social media is a relatively new term, isn't it? And reportedly, there's been a bit of jockeying as individuals try to assert rights to that term. An executive at AOL believes it came out of AOL in the early 1990s when the company was developing what would become AOL, Instant Messenger. There are so many definitions for social media floating around. One example goes like this. Social media is a term that encompasses a smorgasbord of online media where people are talking, participating, sharing, networking, and bookmarking online with a wide variety of options from social sharing sites such as YouTube and Instagram through social networks such as LinkedIn and Facebook. Social media is huge in this age of technology, but I sometimes wonder just how many people really use social media sites. A lot. 2018 data indicate that there are more than three and one half billion internet users. Estimates are that social media users grow by one new user every 15 seconds. You compare that to every 20 seconds in the United States, someone is diagnosed with diabetes. Well, every 15 seconds, there's a new social media user. According to statistics from the Nielsen Group, Internet users in the United States spend more time on Facebook than any other website. In Australia, nearly three-fourths of the population are active Facebook users, with half the population logging onto the site at least once a day. In the United States, more than four-fifths of the population use Facebook spending an average of 20 minutes per day on the site. And Instagram is second in the United States after Facebook. YouTube is the world's largest video network with users spending upwards of a billion hours per day watching. What are some of the upsides to social media? Almost anything on this planet has an upside and a downside. Personally, I do the majority of work with my nonprofit corporation, Realizations Inc., via technology. I have almost instant worldwide communication with anyone else who has a computer or mobile phone. Almost instant access to data and state of the art information, and on and on and on. Reports suggest that on the internet, Every click, every view, and every emotion is tracked and noted somewhere in the form of statistics in order for businesses to understand the user's behavior and be better able to market their products. And there's another upside. Users get to chat with each other online and post pictures and updates about their lives and individuals who are housebound or must stay in bed are still able to stay connected with family and friends via social networks. In life, we typically give up something to get something. That suggests that there can be a downside to social media technology when it's used inappropriately or out of balance, as you indicated. What are some of the potential downsides? So the short answer is that the human brain is extremely sensitive to the outside world. 
Therefore, technology used inappropriately or out of balance can create some real problems for the brain. And again, especially for the developing brain. Current studies show that the prefrontal cortex of the brain, the part right behind your forehead, is not done, meaning all the myelination is not completed, think fiber optics, until late 20s and possibly early 30s. According to Psychology Today, what a teenager does and is exposed to has a large influence on that teen's future because experience and current needs shape the pruning and sprouting process in the brain. When a brain is born, it has way more neurons than it actually needs. And especially during the first five years, and then again during the teenage years, functions that are not utilized, the brain just prunes and gets rid of those cells, figuring they're not needed. So something like being the class clown, for example, can help make a good salesperson later on. And running for class president will help develop brain skills that are needed to run a business or take on a management position. So if a teenager is playing lots of video games, this will shape the brain in such a way that they might become an excellent fighter pilot but becoming an accountant or a researcher will likely be less possible. Being exposed to negative influences on social media also shapes the brain and the future of the adolescent. It can sow the seeds of addictive behaviors and interpersonal conflict. Research has shown that in order to develop effective socialization skills, the brain needs real-time, real-life, face-to-face experiences. Practicing striking up a conversation with another individual and setting them at ease through small talk. When the outside world primarily consists of Facebook, email, LinkedIn, texting, tweeting, and surfing the net as it's called, looking up things on the internet, Exposure and practice in face-to-face -face communication is reduced. Some studies have shown that talking in cyber shorthand, as it is called, most of the time, can make it less likely that that brain will be able to walk into a crowd of complete strangers and initiate an enjoyable conversation face-to-face. -face. Remember, the teenage brain is not done yet. It is rather a self-absorbed and somewhat narcissistic chunk of biological real estate, as in, it's all about me. Maturing the teenage brain is a learned process designed to move it away from narcissistic behaviors to more balanced and functional adult behaviors. This is a learning process. It is not an automatic genetic process. So an unbalanced use of technology during adolescent years can interfere with the brain's actual maturation process. Unfortunately, if the teenage brain fails to mature and move to more balanced behaviors, it tends to continue narcissistic, it's all about me, behaviors into adulthood. The danger is that the antisocial narcissistic adult may begin to exhibit sociopathic behaviors. I suppose time spent on social media sites can be an issue as well. Studies have shown recently that those who spend three or more hours per day on Facebook or other social media sites tend to occupy self with self they are at high risk for becoming restless, anxious, and depressed as they compare what was posted with what they personally possess. They tend to use lower brain functions 
from the first or second layers of the brain over higher brain functions in the third layer, the neocortex. And they tend to exhibit decreased empathy and compassion. When you can't see or hear another person, it becomes easier to be less embarrassed and less inhibited and less concerned about what other people even think. It becomes easier to reveal things about yourself that you wish later on you had not done and or said things to or about other people that you might never do in person. Really, social media can take over your life in a nanosecond if you aren't careful. Just anticipating connecting with someone via social media can trigger the release of oxytocin as well as dopamine, the feel better chemical. People have actually become so involved in social media that they've dropped out of school, quit their job, lived on the street, and really checked out of reality living in favor of just surfing their favorite sites day and night. Many businesses frown on employees checking social media frequently when they're supposed to be doing the company's work, the work they're being paid to do. And most unfortunately, cyber harassment and bullying behaviors and other negative types of communication have invaded social media. Suicide attempts and suicide successes have occurred repeatedly and been reported due to cyber harassment and bullying. And then there's the unsafe connections that are made over the internet that have sometimes resulted in abductions and even murders. Some individuals have even created a fake identity known as a sock puppet in an attempt to avoid accountability for what they spew out over the internet or in an attempt to remain anonymous. The problem with this is that great damage can be done to susceptible individuals. And a big downside involves something called gaslighting. This term was picked up from a 1944 movie in which a man uses various techniques in an attempt to make his wife start wondering about her own sanity so that he could put her in an institution, have her institutionalized. The author of the book, Gaslighting, pointed out that this tactic is commonly seen among dictators, narcissists, abusers, and cult leaders who gain power over targets by destabilizing people's mental states and making them doubt their own perceptions of reality. Unfortunately, the practice of gaslighting is common on social media sites, where the perpetrator may disseminate inaccuracies, outright lies, and disinformation. I read that some communication skills are being lost due to social media. When I talk about social media, I like to talk about face-to-face -face communication, especially that learned ability to put people instantly at ease using small talk, especially when the individuals do not know each other. According to some studies, this skill is rapidly disappearing. I've sometimes talked about with you the fact that there can be two people sitting in a restaurant and they're each on their electronic devices with hardly any verbal communication. I even asked a young couple about that once, and they looked at me like I was from another planet. They replied that they were talking to each other. They were compute communicating. They were just doing it via their devices. But there was no eye contact. There were no facial expressions. There was no laughter. Just typing with their thumbs. That's not face-to-face, real-time interaction with one brain with another. And then there is fubbing. Do you know the term fubbing? 
Studies have shown that ignoring someone in a social situation to look at one's phone threatens people's fundamental need to belong. It's typically perceived as a form of social exclusion, making others feel invisible, eroding their self-esteem. They actually feel less important than whomever the other person is communicating with electronically. Fubbing has been linked with poor communication and lower relationship satisfaction. Because of that, some organizations require that social media electronics must be turned off during important business meetings and committee interactions. So how much more important to turn that off when you are working on a communication relationship with people you love, with family members and good friends? My brain's opinion is that even a positive thing taken to the extreme or used out of balance can become a negative. Social media is one of those things. It points out the need to practice disconnecting from social media for some period of time every single day. This can help the user to build skills related not only to delaying gratification, and delaying gratification is critical to almost every type of success, but also raising the person's level of emotional intelligence, judged to be worth 80% of a person's overall success in life. So in life, you usually, if not always, must give up something to get something. Maturity involves evaluating what you will get versus what you will have to give up when making a decision. So with some knowledge and forethought, you can obtain the benefits social media and technology offer while at the same time avoiding creating problems for your brain. Dr. Taylor, it's been a pleasure having you on our program today. And we're so grateful for all the important information you've shared with us. Once again, it's a pleasure to chat with you about brain function. And I encourage people to take the time to do person to person, brain to brain communication. It's a different type of connection from social media. Social media has certainly taken the world by storm. And now it's hard to imagine a world without the internet, our smartphones, emails, and instant communication. In fact, it doesn't matter where you go in this world, people seem to be attached to their phones. The need and desire to communicate is not new to the 21st century. Way back in the first century, the Apostle Paul wrote some wise words to the people in Thessalonica. Now, they didn't have social media back then, but the principles of communication are the same. Here's what Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 11. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up. Here, Paul is exhorting the people to only say kind words, words that are affirming and helpful, and to avoid unkind and discouraging words. There's an old Yiddish saying that says, a word and an arrow are the same. Both deliver with speedy aim. Once words have been spoken or sent via social media, we cannot call them back. Today, the powerful platform of social media gives us instant words. Sometimes on social media, words may be sent off quickly, words that you might not think of using if you are communicating in person face to face. Let's choose to only say or write words that will not discourage, disempower or be negative. Let's follow the Apostle Paul's advice in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 29. Here's what he wrote. 
Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. What a difference that would make in our world if only kind and encouraging words were said in person or communicated via technology. If our comments were positive, helpful and empowering. So the question then is, what aspects of social media are positive and provide positive outcomes? And what aspects are negative and provide negative outcomes? If you would like to know more about the effects of media on the brain, then I'd like to recommend the free gift we have for all our incredible journey viewers today. It's a small booklet, Media on the Brain. In this booklet, you will read what the latest scientific research says about the mind-altering effects of 21st century media. This booklet has helped many people escape the trap of media addiction and restore healthy relationships. So don't miss this wonderful opportunity to receive the free gift we have for you today. I guarantee there are no costs or obligations whatsoever. Phone or text us at 0436 333 55 in Australia or 020 422 2042 in New Zealand or visit our website tij.tv to request today's free offer and we'll send it to you totally free of charge and with no obligation. Write to us at GPO Box 274, Sydney, New South Wales, 2001, Australia, or PO Box 76673, Manukau, Auckland, 2241, New Zealand. Don't delay. Call or text us now. If you've enjoyed our journey into the world of social media and the impact our words can have on other people, then be sure to join us again next week when we will share another of life's journeys together. And now I'd like to invite you to join me as we pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us the ability to communicate and to share our thoughts and feelings. We ask that you give us wisdom as we choose our words and may they always be positive, helpful and empowering and most of all, to reflect your love for us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.